Dr. Demartini, welcome back to the show. How are you doing hey, today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me back. I after, say I, after a hurricane. <laughs> Yeah, I say back to we tried a, a round one and now we're going in for a round two. So Absolutely. this will be this will be fantastic. <laughs> well, Dr. Demartini, you are the foremost expert on human behavior, and you've stated that grief shouldn't exist for longer than three hours. Would you walk me through a little bit of how you came to that conclusion? <laughs> when Donald Trump a few years ago when he was president shot down with drones the germ the the general of Iran I believe his name was Soleimani uh, five million people came out and mourned his death because he was a hero in that country but in America we perceived him as a terrorist and so no one was grieving the loss of him when they saw him as a terrorist, they grieved the loss of when they perceived him as a hero. So anytime you perceive people having more drawbacks than benefits, more negatives than positives, more disadvantages and advantages, more dislikes than likes, more hates than admirations, when they depart, you don't have a grief or loss. You have a, a relief. But whenever you have an infatuation and admiration, and you see more positives and negatives, you have a grief and loss phenomenon. So when somebody dies, there's two sides. And they don't want to admit it because socially we've been programmed that if a baby's born, that's good. And if a, if a person dies, that's bad. Life is good, death is bad. That's just a standard procedure in most conventions and traditions. But when a baby's born, a mother has two sides. The mother has the side, oh, my baby's here and finally happy. Another one go, oh, God, what am I getting myself into? I don't know what I'm going to do. It. And is my life going to be the same? What am I going to do with my career? How my body is going to look? Da, 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 da. And there's two sides. One is usually talked about. The other one is just repressed. And when a grandma dies, <clears throat> particularly if it's a long, prolonged death, you know, it's taken weeks or months, there's a part that goes, grandma died. And then there's another one that, but I'm glad it's now because this could have dragged out for another five years or 10 years of taking care of this person that might be invalid or something. So if you have more drawbacks and benefits, there's a relief. If there's more benefits and drawbacks, there's a grief. If you put them into balance and see both sides, there's neither grief or relief. <clears throat> now, I've been doing that since 1984 clinically. I've taken thousands of people through that process. I've never seen it take more than three hours to actually neutralize the grief of people. And people, when they first hear that, they go, what? It's normal to grieve. It's healthy to grieve. Animals grieve. That may be true that it's animals grieve. But there's, there's, it's questionable whether or not you actually have health from that because cardiovascular, digestive, immune, skin conditions, and even cancers associated with prolonged grief syndrome. <clears throat> so I know how to help people by asking certain questions and helping people answer those questions and become cognizant of things. There's all that. And I've been doing it. 5,000 cases of death I've done easily. And I do it every week, literally. <clears throat> I also noticed something that most people probably don't or may not have ever paid attention to, they might have, but I find it rare, that when somebody leaves or departs or decide, de 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 deceases and they decide, you know, they, they pass, somebody else takes on the traits. Yes. And most people don't realize that, but somebody else takes on the traits. And all of a sudden, there's people in your life that are playing out the behaviors now, first, people are going to say, no, I don't agree with that. I don't believe with that. And I have skeptics every week coming into the program when I have them go through it. But once I methodically take them through the process, they go, oh, my God, it's true. So I first learned that when I was a teenager living on the streets. And I, I realized that whatever I was thinking I might be missing in family was showing up in other people. Other people were playing surrogate roles. They know this in psychology. They know that if we don't see surrogate roles, we come, we create artificial ones. We'll, we'll have a doll, for instance. 
When I was four years old, there was a girl that lived across the street named Pamela. And I noticed something peculiar. I didn't know why. I now later know why, but at the time I didn't know why. But I noticed that when her mom worked in the afternoon and she came home from school, she'd walk home and we would play. And sometimes she'd play boy stuff. Sometimes she'd want me to play girl stuff. I really wasn't into it, but I noticed sometimes when I do it, that she would turn the doll she had into a mother. And she would have the doll tell her, now do this, now do you drink your milk, and now do this. And this doll was playing out a surrogate mother's role. And then the moment the mom came home around 5.15, the doll turned into a doll that she was mother to. And I saw that peculiar thing at, at, when I was four, a peculiar behavior that why is she turning the doll from a mother into a child, her, her child, and that same doll now becoming her mother. But I realized, studying this field in the psychology area, that people will take something and convert dolls or in a, in an objects or sometimes blankets or whatever into a part of the family that they feel is missing at that moment. And, and so if we don't find that somebody else merges uh, through uh, reality, we find that we create a virtual reality in order to get that met. And when I show people the reality of the virtual reality of who's taking on the emerging traits on the ones that de submerged upon deceased or departure, it's mind-blowing when they see it and they go, wow, I'm not missing it. And then when I go in and find out, that, make sure the quantity is equal and it's, as, as it's accounted for, and then I show them the benefit of the new form and the drawbacks of the old form to break the infatuation, the grief is gone. I took so, 700... So 55 people through a grief process at one time um, in India. And I did about 200 people in at the Ishinomaki uh, tsunami in, in, in Japan when the tsunami in 2011, I think, occurred. And I did the same thing in Christ Church at the uh, earthquake. I was asked, my team was brought in to help on the grief process there. And um, we were dissolved it. And then we did the also the Japanese earthquake in 2016. The uh, prefecture asked us to come and bring some facilitators to help them neutralize the grief. And we were knocking out, you know, in two hours we were doing, each of my facilitators were averaging two, two hours, two people every two hours. We were able to dissolve it. So I figured if I took 100 facilitators, we could do 1,000 people a day. In 10 days, we could take 10,000 people who've been through you know, a challenging situation and loss and loss of house. Some people, I've had people lost houses, lost um, three children, a husband, a house, a bank account, a car, and her home all in one time in Christ Church. And we went and dissolved all that. Now, that one took more than three hours because it was more than one grief process. There was like eight things we had to deal with. That took about 11 hours to clear all that. But that's only because we had a number of people and a number of things that were grieving the loss of, not just one person. So, so is the reason that grief persists because people believe it to be a certain way or similar to, to birth is good, death is bad? They have a preconceived idea that this is the way things should be and it should be progressive? Part of it is, part of it is social conditioning because when I was in El Salvador many years ago surfing, I came in from surfing in the morning and I ran into this parade of people, this Two, three hundred, two hundred people, something. And I said, Kapasa, what's happening here? It's a big parade. And they and I thought they're celebrating. They're all wearing colorful white and colorful outfits and partying, it looked like. And he said, Well, we're celebrating the death of our mayor. And I'm like, a what? It's like a, a reframing in my thinking. And I followed him down to the cemetery, and they his belief system and the belief system was that the Spirit is freed from the body, and now it's no longer constrained by the, you know, the body. Kind of like a Platonic idea, Plato's idea, and they were seeing that the death was a celebration, not a, a grief. And I was raised, you know, with Italian and Greek influence that you wear black for two years and you, you're born and all that stuff, and that was the social conditioning. And I have a lady who is married to the Greek dictator that I worked with on a grief of her husband who had leukemia. And um, her belief system was you're supposed to grieve, but we dissolved that in about two and a half hours.
And that night she went out to dinner and met a new guy. <laughs> she, and she would never have imagined she'd run a new guy, but she saw that that was a freedom. So, um, and that, and people say, well, that's, that's crazy. Why would you do things like that? Well, the question is this, and I've asked thousands, and this is thousands of people, if you were to die and you had your loved ones left over, is there anybody here who can honestly say, I want them to be grieving and to be mourning? Or do you want them to live their life to the fullest and live an inspired life and get on with their life and be grateful for my presence and be grateful for my passing? I've never seen anybody can look me straight in the eye and say that I hope they're grieving. So yeah. there's partly a social conditioning and partly because we don't know how to manage our state. And most of the time, it's an amygdala response. The reason why animals do it is because it's an amygdala response, a survival response. But we have the capacity to override our survival response with thrival. And so I'm not saying people have to do it. I'm just saying if they would like to do it, I can show them how to dissolve the grief. It's a totally up to them. But I know with certainty I can dissolve it because I've been doing it. What, is that? what does that process look like? It's, it's four questions. And it goes very simple. It's, it's um, what specific trait, let's say you had a, a spouse that's passed or a boyfriend that dumped you or a, a man that went off with another woman and you're grieving the loss of the man of your life or woman of your life or a child's past or something um, or relative. What specific trait, action or inaction did you perceive this deceased or departed individual display or demonstrate that you admired most and now miss most? And we identify everything. We make sure we're as thorough as we can because I don't want to leave anything hanging. Now, what's interesting, after asking this question since 1984, uh, you will not see one thing listed that they hated. You don't ever see, I miss their farts. I miss their hair in the sink. <laughs> I miss their yelling. I miss their arguments. I miss their, you don't miss that. They don't miss that. Or if they did, it's because they got a benefit from the advice they gave them. But if, if, there's, if there's a perception of more challenge and support and initiated a sympathetic response, there's no, there is no loss of that. You don't ever see it on the list. It's only the things, their smiles, their conversations, their guidance. And their, their generosity, their hugs, their sense of humor. It, it's always the things that create dopamine, oxytocin, encephalons, serotonin, vasopressin in the brain. The neurochemistry of grief and the withdrawal from something you're addicted to are the same symptoms and their same neurochemistry almost. So if you go and find out what it is that they admired most and now miss most and list that, that's the first step. Because they won't have a list uh, that they're missing on things they resented. Because if they, if all of a sudden he was a, an, a let's say that the guy is um, drinks a lot, gambles a lot, and flirts with other women and has affairs, I've not seen that once on there. I miss his affairs. I miss his gambling and losing money. You don't see that. You see, I miss his hugs. I miss his all the things that created dopamine in the brain. That's why if you're infatuated with a guy, you're a girl and you meet this guy and you think, oh my God, he's amazing. If another girl comes along and tries to get him from you, you'll be jealous. You'll be envious, right? If they have that, you'll be jealous. You'll, 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 you'll fight for that. But if you're resenting him and you're ready to end the relationship, you hope another woman takes him. <laughs> you go out and hey. party with your friends. He's finally gone. <laughs> <clears throat> so you don't miss the traits that you despise. You only miss the traits you admire. So the first thing is identifying what specific trait, action, or inaction? It, can, it can't be vague generalities. It can't be hearsays. It's got to be specific perceived actions or inactions or traits that they displayed that you admired most and now miss most. Then the next column, there's say four columns, four questions. The next one is, at the moment you perceive them gone, the moment you were told they're gone or found out they left or found out they died, at the very moment you perceived it, from that moment till now, who emerged with that particular behavior? If you try to take all of them at once, you can't do it. But if you take them and break it down into individual traits, you can do it. 
<clears throat> and you go, what exactly the trait? Who took on the trait? At first, they say nobody. I see that every week. Nobody. Nobody could replace them. No. Go to the moment where and when you perceive this individual now gone. Okay? When you found out about it. Good. At that moment, who started, who started giving you the hugs that that person did? Well, yeah, my brother showed back up in my life. And my dad gave me hugs. And one of my, my husband's best friends is there and been following up on me. And him and his wife have been giving me hugs. Because it could be male or female, close or distant, real or virtual, self or other. You could actually take on some of the traits. When my wife passed, I took on some of a few of her traits. Because she was writing for magazines, and I was not nearly as many magazines. But the moment she passed, magazines took off. I started writing for magazines. I've written now for 1,542 magazines around the world. Magazines went berserk. So I took on some of that role. But I also started associating with people from different magazines. And I saw magazine authors because I was involved in it. So I look at who took on that trait from the time they pass till now. And you account for it quantitatively until you can see that it's not gained or lost. It's just changed in form. There's a transformation there. Once that's accounted for, and I've been doing this, I had 755 people able to do it on a Zoom thing. And, and uh, then I, and I got a document of this before and after what they did. And, we, and they were just, we, nobody could find any grief. So once they found out the new form, the quantity, the quantity has to be equal. So you keep looking and looking and looking until you do it. And it takes 30 minutes, most cases. The average person, when they die, the average grieving traits are around 10. And that takes about 30 minutes to find who took it on, usually. No more than 45 minutes. Once they see that, they go, wow, this person showed up in my life. I'm taking on part of the role. Um, I had a guy that lost it. 12-year-old Down syndrome child in Cape Town, South Africa. And I said, so who took on the Velcro shoes? He couldn't tie his shoes, so they had Velcro shoes for him. I said, who took on the Velcro shoes? He says, nobody. I said, who took on the Velcro shoes? Because you miss putting his Velcro shoes on and, and, and laugh, you know, putting the thing over it. And his wife spoke up. She was sitting right there because they'd lost their son. They thought, and, um, and she said, honey, you don't see it? And, and he goes, what? I don't understand. He said, you started playing soccer like my son. You didn't play soccer. And you have Velcro shoes. You took on his playing of soccer in the Velcro shoes. And he looked at that and he goes, oh my God, you're right. I didn't even realize I did that. That's my way of keeping my son in my life in another form. So I, I basically so this- see where the forms are until the quantity is equal. And then I go to the third column. Go to a Real moment. Quick, before before yeah. we dive into the number three, I have a question on this. Does that mean that all of the relationships and activities and habits that we have in our life are us replacing something that we've that we felt we lost elsewhere? Uh, not necessarily, but they're changing form. Hey. We may not have perceived a loss. We just may have adapted and changed the form because our hierarchy of values is dictating the form. And that's yeah. changing, morphing as we go through life. <clears throat> but we sometimes have little mini, you know, griefs and losses. You know, I lost a friend, I lost a client, I lost a little bit of money. I did, and it doesn't matter what degree of it. You can still do the exercise and neutralize it. It's just that most of the time, I ask people to find the biggest grief they can to train them and show them how to do it. When they have little minor ones, it's easy to do and it's not hard and it's not a big. Because it's a stronger impact, pinpoint in time. Yeah. Yeah. That the next column is number three, which is actually number 17 on my list of columns in the method. But now it says, now go to a moment where and when you perceive this individual displaying or demonstrating the specific trait, action, or inaction you admired most and now missed most. Go to the actual moment they're displaying the behavior. So now you're going to a moment when you're actually perceiving them doing the behavior that you're missing. Now in that moment, what are the downsides to you? And they're going to say, well, there isn't. I said, well, as long as you hold on to a fantasy that it's got all positive and there's no negatives to a trade, you're going to end up feeling a grief because you now have a fantasy about what it was. But every trade has two sides. 
you meet a guy and you think, oh, he's so intelligent. And you think, oh, I got an aphrodisiac, a guy that's intelligent. But then what you have with that is also a guy that thinks they're, they know it all. They're right. They want to argue with you. They, they don't want to listen. There's a downside to every trait. Every trait has benefits and drawbacks. There's no real artificial good or bad trait until we make it so with our own subjective bias. So I go in there and I show them the downsides. And I'm not asking them to look for more downsides and upsides. I'm just asking you to take what you're unconscious of and make yourself conscious of what was there. I don't want them to make anything up. I don't want them to exaggerate it. Or I just want them to look until they balance. And when they balance that, as they balance that, and they see the drawbacks of the trait that they were missing and admiring, you can already feel the... the I can ask them as they're going down it, can you feel this, the grief starting to subside? You go, yeah, it's disappearing. And I said, exactly, because you're no longer in fact with the trait. You are seeing the trait objectively. And if you have a balanced trait, you have pure resilience to for whatever happens. Because it's only the trait you are infatuated with you fear the loss of. And the trait you resent, you fear the gain of. So grieving is the, the perception of loss of the trait you admired, not the one you despised. So I'm just neutralizing it. I don't want to make it... If, if I get and ask him what's the downside and I go too far with it, more drawbacks, more drawbacks, they'll eventually say, God, I wish I'd have killed him earlier. <laughs> They went too far. I'm not interested in making them now resent the person. I'm just interested in them seeing what they're blind to so they can see both sides of the trait because the only reason why they're grieving is because they have an infatuation with that trait. Yeah. Then we come over on the last column, and, and that and we do that for each of the episodes that we perceive them doing it. So if they only saw them do it once, they only have to do one episode and neutralize it. If they saw them do it 10 times, we need to do all 10 episodes. So they go to every memory of when they saw them doing that behavior, and they go and neutralize each of those memories. The first one's the hardest. After that, it's repeats many times. And then in column 18, which is the fourth column, now go to a moment where and when you perceive the newly emerged individual displaying or demonstrating the trait, the new people that's now displaying it. And what's the benefit to you in your highest values and in your seven areas of life? How does it help you? Um, in your life. And when we find the benefit to the new form and we neutralize the old form, and I want the benefit to the new form only until it's equal to the benefit to the original form. And at first they swear, well, there's no way anybody could replace that person. But I, I'll bet them money that I can get them to neutralize that and dissolve that. And then when they're done, there's no grief. There's simply a presence, a feeling of love, a deep gratitude. And in honoring the form, because nobody knows when somebody's going to die or how they're going to die. And sometimes we have a fantasy about that we know, well, they were young. They should have lived longer. According to what? According to who? The way they died is the way they died. That's reality. The rest of it's fantasy. And if we compare our reality to fantasies, we're going to end up having grief and depression. And if we feel like we didn't do something before they had it, we might have uh, guilt. So sometimes I have to create, uh, dissolve some guilt along with it because they're assuming that they caused a pain without a pleasure before they died and they feel guilty. <clears throat> Can I share an example of that? Please. So I had a guy that was uh, grieving the loss of his mom and we dissolved the grief and it took about two hours and 15 minutes. But then he had a little bit of guilt and he was feeling guilty that he didn't get to see his mom before she died. He wasn't able to make it because they lived in two different cities and he wasn't able to fly there in time. He waited and he was leaving the next day and she died before he got there. So he's beating himself up and feeling guilty that he didn't there, wasn't there for his mom. And all I asked him is a simple question. So how did that benefit your mom? It didn't, he said. I didn't ask that. That's what your belief is. That's why you're feeling guilty. So how did it benefit your mom? I don't know. Look again. I can't see it. Try looking again. When somebody says, I can't see it and I don't know within one hundredth of a second, they didn't look. <laughs> I said, so look again. And then all of a sudden he stared for a minute. And he got tears in his eyes and he goes, whoa. I said, what is it? <clears throat> My mom died. And he, he, she died in my sister's arms. 
My sister and her for 12 years were hardly talking. They had a rift and they weren't even talking to each other. If I would have gotten there on time, my mom would have died incomplete with her daughter and the daughter would have had an incomplete with the mom. I know that my mom loved me. I know I loved my mom. But I know now that my mom wouldn't have it any other way but be able to make that res resolution before she died. He says, if I would have been there, they wouldn't have resolved. My sister wouldn't have been the one that held her. And he started to grow and he goes, man, I can't believe I couldn't see that. I said, quality of your life is basically quality of the questions you ask. If you ask the right questions that balance out the mind, you're liberated from a lot of emotional baggage and guilt is one of them. So I'm certain that this can be done. It's just a matter of asking the right question and helping people see things that they're unconscious of. And so I love doing it. I love helping people. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, I'm not interested in resolving my um, grief, I said, okay, no, there's no pressure. If you are lo loving to, if you'd love to do it, I'm there for you if you want it. I had two people that live on the ship here with me. Their husband and dad, because it was a daughter mom, uh, suddenly died at 65. I ch chatted with him two weeks earlier, and he had a heart attack. He had a reaction to the uh, COVID vaccine, a pericarditis vaccine response, and he suddenly died, and uh, they were grieving. And I, I saw them in the little story here on the ship, and I said, I said, if you would like to have a conversation, I might be able to help you with that. And because they say, well, we can't, we're not sleeping very well, we're not willing to talk to people, we're I've got, we've got intrusive thoughts. We're just in shock. And the da, 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 da. I said, let me know if you'd like to chat. So the daughter called me and we sat and had a session. We only had an hour for the first session. We then, she came back the next day. We finished it up about an hour and 10 minutes. And so two hours and 10 minutes and all done. She goes to her mom and she said, I'm, here's what I learned from this. The mom's like going, wow, I never thought of it that way. And then she said, is he available for me? And so she came. And I spent about about two hours and 30 minutes with the mom and um, done. And then everybody on the ship was going like, well, I thought you were grieving. And they said, no, no, not now. We talked to John. So all these people come up to me and said, what the hell did you do? And I said, I've asked, I've developed a system for helping help people dissolve grief and get on with their life. And that would be the most, I know the, the husband, I know that's what he would want. He'd want them to live their life to the fullest. I would want to do the same yes. thing. I'm, if my if I died before my wife, I'd want her to live her life to the fullest and find another guy and get on with her life and do whatever she wanted to do, what was meaningful to her. And my wife passed before I did, and so she wanted the same thing for me. It's fascinating that you use that as the example. I lost my mom when I was 17, and I repressed it for a very long time, and it was the attachment to the way I thought things should be that caused the most pain. Yeah. not the actual event itself. And once I transmuted that into recognizing that this was happening for me, it actually led me to the path that I'm on now and the reason that I am where I'm at today. Exactly. Well, anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can say thank you for is fuel. And everything's on the way to the master, but everything seems in the way to most people in the masses when it doesn't match their fantasy. And we get addicted to moral hypocrisies and fantasies about how life's supposed to be and don't appreciate life the way it is. The way it is is far more magnificent than the fantasies we keep holding on to. Taking a quick break from this episode to remind you that your inputs matter. This show was designed and created to help you build a high-performing, healthy, wealthy life. So if you feel that you're getting value from this episode, please go ahead and share it with someone that you feel would get value as well. Now, fun fact, 90% of listeners of this show are not actually subscribed to the podcast. So if you would take a moment and go ahead and tap the subscribe button, it would mean the world to me. Thank you so much for being here. Now back to the show. You mentioned hierarchy of values. Talk to me a little bit about how you identified that humans live based on a hierarchy of values. Yeah, I wanted to know why some people walk or talk and some people limp their life. and. I was interested in on the different types of motivation. There was external motivation and internal motivation. And I was interested in what is intrinsic motivation versus extrinsic motivation. And that led me to the hierarchy of values. Whatever's highest on an individual's value hierarchy, they're spontaneously inspired to act on. 
Now, in my case, my highest value is teaching. So I spontaneously am inspired to teach and share ideas. My second highest value is researching and writing. I spontaneously research and write every single day of my life. I mean, literally every day. And I travel. I live on a ship that travels full time, and uh, or I'm flying. And I've done 21 million miles of travel. So it's very obvious that I have travel as a value. So if you stop and look carefully, what is your life demonstrating tells you what you value. Because every perception, decision, and action you take is what's based on your values. And whatever you spontaneously do is high, and whatever you need motivation, external motivation to do is low. So all you have to do is think of a young boy who's 12 years old uh, who loves video games. And uh, do you need to motivate him to do video games? No. He's intrinsically driven to do the video games. Do you need to motivate him to do his chores, homework, and clean his room? Yes. That's extrinsically motivating. So your mom says, if you don't do your chores, you can't play video games. Once you play video, once you do your chores, you can play video games. So she'll use external motivation linked to highest values in order to get him to do what she wants. And so, but if you try to get people to do something that's low on their values, you'll need to motivate them externally and keep motivating them. And it's a transient motivation at best. And nobody stays consistent. They tend to procrastinate, hesitate, and frustrate in those. And they're disciplined, reliable, and focused in their highest values. So I developed a system to determine what is the highest values in people to help know what you can trust and uh, they're reliable and disciplined to do. And nobody goes to work for the sake of a company. They go to work to fulfill their values. If they see that their job description is able to help them do that, they'll be engaged at work and they'll be productive. If not, you're going to have to constantly motivate them, remind them to do it and keep training them and constantly frustrate yourself. So training people and hiring people is based on values. So that's that's the difference. And everybody has a unique set of values. No two people have the same set. They're fingerprint specific. And I've been doing value determinations for 46, well, 48 years. No, is that right? 1978. So that's it's 44 years. 44 years I've been doing value determinations and developed my own value determination process because I wasn't satisfied with what was being taught out there. Much of what's being taught out there is a bunch of social idealisms about how you ought to be. And, yeah. you know, a descriptive and a normative instead of an actual, what's the individual really truly dedicated to? And then a lot of people have internal conflicts because they're thinking, I should be doing this, but I'm not. I must be having a weakness or something wrong with me. And they're beating themselves up because they're trying to live in somebody else's values instead of honoring what their own is. And I stopped doing that about 40 years ago. I realized it's a waste of time to try to live in other people's values <clears throat> or in society's traditional conventions and mores, because those are ideals that somebody made up for the sake of society with their own bias. If you study political theory and moral theory, you'll find out that there's a whole bunch of, there's a whole spectrum of value systems imposed by different theorists, but none of them are necessarily true. So I'm not interested in any of that. I'm interested in what does your life demonstrate uh, in your value structure so I can know what to expect from you. My, my, my girlfriend is a singer and an actress and a model, and I know that she's going to be singing. And she does it every day. I know if she's got an opportunity to, to, to do an, an acting a show, a movie or something, she's gone it. And I know she's going to be working out for her body and her, her modeling, but I can't expect her to be doing some of the other things that I may want. I can't expect her to live in my values. And I can't ex expect myself to live in her values. But I can expect, and so, I can communicate what I value in terms of her values so she gets a value out of being with me. And I can see how her values serve me so I don't have to fix her hmm. or change her. And she loves so our, she doesn't be our fixed. values you loved. Our values innate then or learned? Both. We we have it our values derive from our voids. Our voids come from our judgments. Our judgments come from things we're too proud or too humble to admit that we see in others inside ourselves. So they're voids and emptinesses inside from judgments that create the values to try to teach us how to love the things we've judged. And we have what they call multi-generational epigenetically stored values, which show up as impulses and instincts. We have gestational values. They're picked up during our gestation of nine months. And then from the time we're born till now, we're accumulating new ones from all the judgments and experiences 
And then we have injected values that we pick up from society. All of those are competing for daily attention. And knowing how to find out and sift out your own values in a world that wants you to be fitting into the, the world's values uh, is the key to be able to be an auto autonomous and independent and an original thinker, original individual. So if someone then wasn't spontaneously driven towards a thing that they think they should be working towards, it's because they're optimizing or aligning around something that society has conditioned rather than that's an innate there's value There's no to should. There's, there's no imperatives or should on your highest value. I've been doing value determinations for 44 years. Nobody hey. has a should on their highest value. Shoulds are always lower values. Anytime you hear yourself using imperatives, I've got to do it. That's an outside force doing that. I must do it. Outside force. Have to do it. Outside influence. Should. Outside influence. Ought to. Outside influence. That's why Nietzsche called it ought to versus is. What is your values versus what ought to be. And then supposed to. Outside values. Need to. Outside values. Intrinsic values start with what? Desire. Choose. Love. When you're doing something you love and loving what you do, you don't ever say should. So anytime you hear imperatives, there's, that's a conflict. And many people have a conflict between what they would love to do and what they think they should do. And if they've subordinated to an outer authority, they're going to have an internal conflict. So anytime we put people on a pedestal and put, and put them as an authority and inject some of their values into our life and think we should do it, we're going to cloud the clarity of our own highest value, which is our mission and our teleological purpose and our ontological identity. And we're going to cloud that and we're going to feel like we don't know who we are and why we're here. But the moment we actually take them off the pedestal and level the playing field and realize that what we see in them, we have, and we're no longer too humble to admit we have it, and level the playing field, we give ourselves permission to go back to our own values. And I've been doing this for decades. And I can show that and watch the language change. The moment I get them congruent, the language changes. You don't hear any of those shoulds and got tos and have tos. Those are all imperative where, languages. Where does someone begin to find their highest values? Well, they can go on my website and do a value determination process free. It's private. It doesn't take but about 30 minutes of your time. If you're slow, maybe 40. And um, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an eye opener. Because I guarantee if you ask people, because I've asked a lot of people, you know, what do you think your values are? And I have them write it down. Then I take them through this process and they look more objectively and they go, wow, was I, was I living in a delusion about who I was? Because they're, what their life demonstrates tells me what they value, not what their words say, but what their life demonstrates. Because if you ask people about their values, they'll tell you peace and harmony and integrity and honesty and all these social idealisms. And I say, well, where, how does your life demonstrate that? And it's filled with all kinds of conflicts and moral hypocrisies. So I'm interested in what your life demonstrates. My life demonstrates teaching. I've got, this is the 88th presentation so far this year. So that will give you an idea how many times I teach doing presentations. But well, this isn't a seminar. This is just a podcast. But 88 presentation seminars so far this year. <laughs> I don't think we've had even 88 days yet. I, I recently listened to a podcast with Andrew Huberman, who spoke about, a, I have in the notes here, anterior mid-cingulate cortex, a part of the brain that grows in proportion to doing something that in which you don't want to do. So whether it's unintentional or intentional, but it builds willpower. So it's a muscle that can be strengthened. If you've gone ahead and removed all of the things that aren't in alignment with that highest value, you're only ever doing things that are spontaneously pulling you towards the thing that you want to be doing. Do you feel that that is in opposition to that? No, I, I, can, I can guarantee you that when somebody's forcing themselves to do something, they're doing something they think they should be doing instead of what they really love to do. And I, I have no interest in doing that. Um, that causes cytokine in responses, autonomic responses. It, you, it backfires on your health over time. But you'll get something done if you force it. So it's not that you won't yes. accomplish something because you'll force yourself to do it. But I don't find that needed. I mean, I, I, I set out to do when I was 17 to travel the world and teach and research and write. And I'm 70 in a few months. And... And I do what I love every day, and I'm pretty inspired by it. And most people can't keep up with my energy levels, and so I, I don't, I don't, I delegate anything that requires an extrinsic motivation for me to do. I fire, I hire somebody to, to do it, and um, 
and let them do it. Let, I find people who are inspired to do what I want to delegate and let them go and do what they excel at and free them up to get a job opportunity and me to go and do what I love to do. To me, that's yeah. self-mastery and sticking to your core company. When I see uh, Warren Buffett, he doesn't do stuff that he doesn't want to do. He's, he reads and re- looks at, at, at financial statements and financial things and wants to do it. I mean, he's, since he was six or seven years old, he wanted to build wealth and he wanted to help uh, financial matters. He does that pretty well most every day. And he might do interviews, <laughs> but he doesn't sit there and uh, he does, I don't want to go to meetings. I don't want to do that. I've, I've got competent people that do that. And I don't want to interfere with them, and that's not my my thing. So I just say no to things. I say no to anything that doesn't inspire me, and I say yes to things that inspire me. And I dedicate to what inspires me, and I delegate what any, anything that doesn't. And I'm I, I'm very grateful for my life because of that. So no, I'm not interested in forcing myself to do something that I think I should be doing that um, to get what I want because I don't feel like I'm forcing myself to teach. I love that. I don't force myself to read and write. I I love doing that. But if I had to force myself doing something, man, that'd be a, that's called distress. I agree with you 100%. And the way that I had interpreted it was through doing things for your health, as an example, deliberate cold exposure, where you know that there is pain upon entering a cold plunge or a tub, but then because of it, the health benefits are enormous. Well, um, you know, I, I did the polar plunge in Antarctica and jumped into water just to see what that's like. Been there, done that. I don't feel like I have to do that. And I can't guarantee if you do polar plunges, you're going to live longer either. That's no absolute certainty about that. You might. Might also have a heart attack. <laughs> so that also is possible. So there's all kinds of beliefs out there about what you need to do to live longer or to live healthier or whatever. And you got others that are oxidizing themselves with overworkouts and other people that, uh, I mean, I've got a guy that's 93. I, I, I said, when's the last time you worked out? He says, 30 years ago. And and there's a whole spectrum of people out there with different beliefs. I can't guarantee that any of those are the only way or the way. And sometimes we subordinate our assumptions based on something somebody says, and then we force ourselves to do something. And when we force ourselves to do it, our autonomic nervous system comes on place. But if, if I would rather do this, I'd rather take the action than I found was um, shown to be helpful. And I'd ask, how specifically is doing this action going to help me fulfill my highest values? And if I answer that, it'll literally, I can take something the person thinks they've got to do, and I can change the ratio of perceptions on that and make them inspired and love doing that. And to me, why would I fight it and go against my own will inside? I'd rather go and find out how it's going to do it and then make it something I would love to do. So I'm not fighting it at all, just spontaneously do it because it's a wise thing to do. So if I see a if, wise action, I don't force myself to do it. I link it to my highest values and super task it and find out how it's going to help me get my dream. And that's why I eat the way I do. I eat very, you know, simple, light foods. I don't eat sugars. I don't drink alcohol. I don't smoke or I, I have a very simple disciplined lifestyle, not because of forcing it. It's I found something that seems to work from trial and error and experience. And I've asked, how is doing this consistently helping me fulfill my mission? And in my brain, it's on the way, not in the way. So there's no f- forcing and discipline needed. It's just something I love doing. I'd much yeah. rather come Be- from that perspective. I, I bet I, you I, I agree with the guy that thinks he's got to do it. And I bet you in, in one or two hours, I could have that guy, if he answered the questions, I guess I, I bet I could take it from something he feels he's got to do to something he loves to do. And it's not a resistance anymore. And it's not a force and it's not a discipline. It's just a spontaneous action. I guarantee I could turn him and shift that in two hours with him. Because it's then be in alignment with what he values most. Yeah. Hmm. And I guarantee that- the cytokines, I guarantee the autonomic nervous system, anytime you're doing something that you're that you, that you have internal conflict and you're having to force yourself to do, your immune system is attacking itself. Guaranteed. Yeah. Taking the conversation back to to grief for a moment, do you believe that trauma exists? Trauma is a perception. Can I share a story about that one? I, I was hoping you would. All right. So I had a guy that uh, was driving down the highway, freeway, 
and four cars came around him and surrounded him, two in the front, two in the side. They slowed down, forced him to slow down, and he like saw that this is going to be some sort of a attack. He shut his doors and shut the locked the doors and everything else. And uh, they got out, and with machine guns and guns and headgear, they knocked out his windows, undid his car, grabbed him, put a thing over his head, and stuck him in the trunk, and um, left his car on the highway and drove off. All cars went in different directions, but one car took him for about five and a half hours. He was in the back of the trunk. He wanted to pee. He wanted to poo. He was, the fumes were strong. He wanted to get out of that trunk. On the way there, he got to this barn thing that he was put in, and they wanted millions of dollars, very large sum of money. And he was owner of a major company in that country, and they wanted ransom money. And they had uh, proof that they had their, their family at uh, gunpoint. And they're going to kill the family and kill him if he didn't deliver. Now, just like Donald Trump, you know, $400 million, he might not have liquid cash. This guy didn't have the liquid cash to just hand over. He would have to sell assets or leverage or get loans or whatever to get that type of liquidity together, what they were asking for. Even though he had a lot of wealth, it was tied up in investments and tied up in businesses and real estate and all kinds of things. You can't just unload it overnight. So it took him a while to get the thing, the money out. And they're not going to kill the family and, you know, if he's trying and he's trying to get the money for him. He gets the money to them. They release him in the middle of nowhere. He walked for, I don't know, two and a half days to finally get to where he was found again. Got home. His family was alive. And, and I asked him while he was in the trunk, um, at the moment you're in the trunk, what did you perceive? He felt it was dark. And so I wrote down dark. And on the opposite, I wrote down light. I, I said I was constrained and I couldn't move hardly. Freedom, the opposite. I had fumes. It was it smelled like gas fumes. Uh, fresh air. Uh, I thought I was going to have my family killed, and then I was losing my family. The family is there with him, secure, in the mind. I'm looking for the opposite. I said, now go to that exact moment where that occurs, because any time. You have a situation, you can't fight something, you can't flight something. You go to a freeze response. And a freeze response activates a certain area in the temporal parietal region of the brain and causes a dissociation and a complementary opposite fantasy in the brain to counterbalance the freeze. Because a freeze response is a survival response when you can't fight or flight something. Animals do that because predators don't eat dead animals, only scavengers do. And they freeze as a way of keeping themselves from being eaten by predators. So at that exact moment, when he was sitting in that thing, I showed him that at that moment, your mind would have dissociated and created an alternate world. And I had him get really present in that moment. And I, and all of a sudden, his mind showed him walking through a field, kind of skipping through a field, holding hands with all of his family members, his wife and kids, in a fresh air with butterflies and birds, which symbolize freedom and peace, because this is conflict and constraint. He was liberated. It was light, not dark, and he was free. And when he saw those, and we, he saw those, he started, he broke down in tears. And he said, so what you're saying is that in that moment of tragedy or trauma, my mind also had ecstasy and elation. I said, exactly. Your mind will automatically homeostate itself with neurotransmitters and the way the brain is set up. It'll create an anti-memory, as it's called. In Neuron Magazine, uh, March 17th, 2016, there's a great article on that. And what it does, it creates an anti-memory to counterbalance this so-called tragedy. The moment he saw both of them together at that same moment, he goes, wow, my perception of the tragedy and the perception of the ecstasy got joined, and I broke down in tears of gratitude. And I said, yeah, exactly, because there wasn't a tragedy without an ecstasy. And then I said, now, what was the benefit of that situation being constrained? He said, for the first time in my probably 11 years, I felt the love for my family and my kids, and I was taking them for granted. 
And I was walking on the edge in my business, knowing full well that my wife was getting to the edge and was probably going to divorce me because I wasn't taking time for the kids. I wasn't taking time for her. I was so focused on business. He said, when I was there in that, that trunk, I got to feel how much importance that my kids and my family was. I'd never, I was taking it for granted and I was walking on the edge. I said, great. What's another benefit you got there? So I really, really wanted to be with my family and kids, my wife and kids. What else did you get that moment? What's another benefit? He said, well, not in that particular moment, but after I got home, I found out that all these people that I've been trying to push at work to try to take on accountabilities, and I was pushing shit up hills, he said, uh, they weren't taking on accountability because I kept robbing them of it. But when I was gone for those weeks, they had no choice but to rise up and take on accountabilities. And all the people that I was wanting to take accountability took on the accountability. And I said, so in other words, you had an unconscious motive to get them to take on accountability. And you were intuitively questioning whether or how far you can go before your wife is going to divorce you. And you were whispering in your head and you felt trapped, but you didn't know how to get out of that trap. And he says, yes. I said, what's another benefit? He said, well, by the time I got back, I lost weight. And when I got home, my wife, I found out my business made more money that month than the entire normal month plus the ransom. And I said, so what you're saying is at the end of the month, you made more money after the ransom than you normally do. He said, I made more money than the ransom. I said, so what you're saying is that these guys got you to appreciate your family, got you to finally delegate things, got you on track with your business, made you lose weight. He says, I was having high blood pressure and overeating and eating on the run. I wasn't taking care of my health. And now I'm doing a yoga class with my wife. I've lost weight. I'm eating differently. I'm with my kids. My business is making me money. And I have a completely new perspective on life. And he broke down in tears. He said, I almost feel like I want to thank these guys for what they did for me. They saved my life and my marriage and my business and my fortune. And I said, now you're getting down because the quality of your life is basically quite the questions you ask. I asked you a new set of questions. And he'd been going to a therapist for months post-traumatic stress disorder and labeled him and psychiatric medications and all that other crap that was going on, this was over with. When he left the consult, which was two hours and 20 minutes, he went back to his wife and I got a letter from his wife said, thank you for bringing my husband home. I cannot tell you how much he's, he's, he's centered. He's not distressed. He's not having anxiety. He's now grateful. He said that he spent thousands and thousands of dollars on consults to try to get all those outcomes. And these people came into my life and gave me all the outcomes that I was hoping for. And I got my outcomes and saved my marriage, saved my business, saved my income, saved my health. I'm not traumatized. So is it trauma or is that because we haven't looked deep enough, broad enough, wide enough to see all parts of it? And people can easily label things. That's a terrible event. You know, that's happened. This happened. I don't come from that idea. I, I say that everything is an event until you, and you can make a heaven out of a hell or a hell out of a heaven, as Milton says. And I ask questions to help you reframe the thing so you can see it. And then you have what is called post-traumatic growth instead of post-traumatic stress disorder. And then you go, thank you. And anything you can't say thank you for is baggage. Anything you can say thank you for is fuel. So I ask questions that most people are afraid to ask and help them see things that they couldn't see that they were unconscious of, but intuitively trying to get to. And I don't ask them anything that they can't answer. I just make them look at things they never saw before because I'm not attached to the idea of, I'm not interested in having compassion and, oh, you poor thing, oh, and sympathize with them and all that. I don't find that productive. And Emerson warned against that. It keeps people in their victim mentality. I'm asking questions to help them see both sides of life so they can be liberated from the misperception that they're holding on to and the fantasy that they're comparing their life to that's keeping them stuck. Why then are we yeah. often complicit in creating the conditions we say we don't want? Well, sometimes what we say we want 
isn't what our, that's our conscious statement, but it's not our unconscious. So let me share another story. <laughs> so I was asked at, at Universal Studios, I was asked to do a reality TV show many years ago. And um, probably 14 years ago now. And they gave me 12 people to change the life in 24 hours. So I had 24 hours nonstop filming to change 12 people's lives, two hours per person. And this was a homeless person, a guy that was an executive that lost everything that ended up homeless, um, a lady that was obese that was eating and binging, uh, a person who was a heroin addict, a person that was uh, raped. I mean, these are not simple little things that you, in two hours you normally would try, try to tackle. And um, But I did what I could in two hours with everybody there. And there was this one lady comes in while I'm working with somebody else. She comes in and brings two boxes of food. And she says, excuse me, but I brought some everybody some food in case they get hungry. And then went on to eat most everything that she brought. I mean, I, she ate more food that day than I ate probably in a week. It was unbelievable. And she was big. So I get to her, her, her time now. I got two hours with her. And um, I asked her a simple question because she's she wanted she starts off saying, "Well, I've got look at me, I'm overweight, I can't stop it, I can't do anything." I, da, 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 da. I said, "Stop, stop the conversation. Running that story has not got you anywhere. So I'm not into you ranting about your story and ranting about your conscious statements. I'm interested in the unconscious motive because no one will continue to do something unless they have more advantages and disadvantages, conscious or unconsciously, in doing so. So." What's the benefit you're getting out of keeping your weight on and eating more than you need? There isn't any. I can't think of any. I don't know of any. Why do you ask such a question? That's cruel. I said, if you want me to help you answer the question, if you want to run your story, then I'm going to go on to the next person because I don't, we don't have time for running your story here. It hadn't got you anywhere. So answer the question. What's the benefit you're getting out of doing that? Finally, she paused for a second, got quiet, and then she said, Everybody in my family is large. If I'm not large, I don't feel like I'm part of the family. I said, okay, minor little thing, but she at least got one. What's the next one? Then she started coming through with them. She said, I have an older sister who's two years older than me. She used to push me around and bully me. And I made a commitment that she's also big. I made a commitment that I would never be smaller than her and I can make sure that she can never push me around. And so no matter what her size is, I'm always bigger than her. That was a childhood decision she made, still sitting in her life. I said, what else? That's two benefits. Now she's willing to go look for her. Then she opens up the hornet's nest. She says, I went on a, a, a very, very strict diet and lost 45 pounds. And I started to get a bit of a shape. The first time in my entire life, I actually had a bit of a shape. And during that time, a guy hit on me and showed affection to me. I never had a guy ever do that. I didn't know what love was. I didn't know. I thought this guy was sincere, and I really believed he showed interest in me. So I kissed, I made out, and we made love. First time I ever made love in my life. The very following morning, never to be seen again, gone. Six and a half weeks later, I found out I was pregnant. Now, I was a Catholic, and I was told that if I have abortion, I'm going to go to hell. If I have a baby out of wedlock, I feel my life is hell because I, I feel like it was, it's not what I wanted, and I don't want that baby because I don't want that man's baby. So I'm now caught between hell and hell, and I chose an abortion, and I associate it with losing weight. So I made sure I never lost weight again because the most painful thing in my life occurred when I lost weight. Then she went on, that's three. <laughs> then another one, she says, I'm in the, in the show business, uh, television business, and I, um, I have a show, and from my breasts up, I look really good. From below, I look like a bowling pin, a balloon, a, a giant. But the way the setting and the, where my show is, I just have the breast up. That's all they see about me. And people always comment about how smooth my skin is. If I ever lose weight, it sags. As long as I eat, the skin's smooth and people compliment me. 
and have beautiful thick hair, and I've made sure my hair is always distracting him from the rest of my body. It says, if I lose weight and I get saggy, I lose my career, and I will then have sags. So we found 72 reasons that were unconscious. And I, in the two hours we didn't do it, but she went home that night. I told her, come back. I'm going to keep working with her, even though I ran out of time with you. And I worked with her after hours and, and kept in contact and helped this girl. And she realized, she said to me on the second day, she said, I really didn't have an intention to lose weight, did I? I said, no. And usually the people that are most adamant about swearing, I got to do it, I got to do it, are the people that have unconscious motives not to. I've seen that over and over again. So unless you find out your unconscious motives, you're not going to lose weight. Now, I've seen women sometimes almost have an affair. They're in a relationship. The husband's working. They're raising kids. They feel trapped. They're not getting what they want. They're not getting the attention because the husband's not doing it. When he comes home, he's not really interested in the last time he had sex with them. Then they had a baby, and then, you know, they got neglected, and then they're, they're, they're not feeling their affection from the husband's side. And, and so they almost had an affair. And when they almost had an affair, they almost destroyed their marriage. So they end up cutting their hair, putting on weight to prevent themselves from having a, uh, an affair with somebody to salvage their marriage. I saw a lady who was a lawyer, and she was uh, just got out, graduated, got a law firm. And every time she get a guy client, within weeks, the guy client would cancel. And she was trying to figure out. So she asked the guys, why did you cancel? Why did, I thought we were working on the case. My girlfriend or wife found out who I was seeing as a lawyer, and they insisted that I don't have that lawyer unless they're there. So she ended up gaining weight, cutting her hair, putting on glasses, making herself look frumpy and masculine, and then she she all of a sudden was putting on weight. She she and she had a motive, and I helped her shift that by helping her make sure that she didn't have to do that by making sure that all wives and girlfriends at all meetings. And as long as they're there and she's asking they're there, they're not, they're trusting her and they make sure he does what they're to do, the guys to do. And when she did, she dropped the weight, let her hair grow out, let her sexuality come back out again. So there's unconscious motives driving a lot of people's behaviors. And I love bringing that out of people and helping them see why they're doing what they're doing. Because what people say they want and what they're doing, if they're not matching, there's an unconscious motive. And that's based on values that have been injected or there's been wounds in there and it's protecting them. And I need to find out what that is to help them through it. So the root of all of this is finding and uncovering what are the subconscious or unconscious values that someone has because they're aligning their life to pull those out or, or, or live those out in a way, whether it's conscious or unconscious. That's it. I had a girl. She was uh, incested. And I asked her, I said, okay, so who is the guy that incest you? Well, it's the stepfather. Good. All right. So um, now how long is this going on? She says 13 to almost 19 for six years. I said, did you scream, yell, yell, bite, go to the police? Did you do anything? No. I said, well, then obviously there's some motive there or you would have done something like that. So what's the, what was the motive here? And at first she was pretending like she couldn't come up with it. And I don't remember. And I said, look, I've been doing this. I've done. 1300 incest cases. And there's always a memory there. It's just, you're dodging it. So let's get to it. We found out that she had a real father, biological father. The mother and him broke up. He left. When she did, the mother didn't have a lot of education, didn't have a job and had to take two jobs on. The income dropped drastically because she had very low education, could only get minimum wage almost. So the daughter now didn't have a way of getting to school didn't have any clothes to go to school in, didn't have half the stuff that the other kids had, uh, didn't always have food on the table, and wanted to commit suicide and was just didn't like her life during her teenage years because of this, and just thought, I can't live like that, and listened to her mom bitch and scream and cry every night and everything else, and she felt like, you know, ever since they broke up, this is life is, is hell. Her mom then meets another guy and is infatuated. And the guy is a good provider. So he comes in and starts providing. She now has school clothes. She now has transportation. She Mom gets a car, gets nice clothes, nicer house. She had a pretty good deal all of a sudden. She wasn't embarrassed. So this is a better life. And close to the guy. And didn't want to lose this one. 
But the mother and him started having fights, and she, the only thing she had control over was her sexuality. So she ended up, you know, controlling her sexuality. The guy didn't have it. He's now got an option of where to go with his sex. He could go to prostitution, go to masturbation, and go to having an affair. He can go to this, or it ends up going in the family sometimes, wherever that outlet is. And it went inside the family. And sometimes that's a strategy for these repressions and family dynamics. So I asked her, so you obviously got a benefit of doing or you would have yelled, screamed, bit, hollered or whatever, but you obviously saw more advantage and disadvantage at her doing it. And she finally admitted, she says, I did that exactly until my mom went back to school and finished school. So I knew she could take care of herself. And then I went on and dated an older guy to find me a daddy figure. And the second I did, I, I said goodbye. But I did that, and she cried. She said, I did that to keep my family together, to not lose another father, and to make sure that I had my mom and me taken care of. She admitted it. So I'm not saying that's all cases, but that was her case. So here's an unconscious motive. And she tried to pretend like she couldn't remember because she didn't want to admit that she was playing a role in this dynamic. But she was. And so, and I don't, I didn't judge it. I don't make it wrong or right. I just say, okay, what's happened so we can now resolve it. And then I said, did you thank yourself for coming up with a strategy for the sake of your mom and for the sake of yourself? And have you ever said, no matter what I've done or not done, I'm worthy of love. And I made her say that. And she cried right down the spot. And she said, it's the first time I've been able to love myself and see that I was strategic. And I did that for my family. I did it for my, my mom. And I did it for for me to have a dad, I wanted to be affectionate. I didn't want to lose all those things. Yes, I had a motive for it. Congratulations. And now you you moved on because now you have the ability to do it with somebody else and your mom's taken care of, so it's over with. And you said goodbye to the guy. And so you did the strategy that worked. Congratulate yourself. It's not what the ideal is. You didn't see alternatives. If there were alternatives, you might have taken them, but that's what you saw, and so you took that route. And she was she was... I mean, it educated everybody in the room when she, because it was a, a live seminar, and everybody in the room got to experience why people do what they do. And there's motives for it, unconscious motives and strategies sometimes in people's lives that we don't even want to face sometimes. And they're working to then bring themselves back to a homeostatic state. They're there to stabilize themselves to get what they want. Mm. She didn't want to lose the, another the... daddy. She didn't want to lose another daddy. The the loss of the first daddy was one of the most painful aspects of her life. And whatever this guy did, as long as there's a daddy figure there, the, the pain, it would not outweigh the pleasure. The having the security of the family and the security of the mother and the security of the things that she wanted. So she was going to play out part of that role to make sure that was there and stabilizing it. Okay. You said the world on the outside is not what matters. It's the perception of the world on the outside that matters. Yep. What does that mean to you? Well, just like the guy, the, 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 what happened to him, he assumed was a trauma and was uh, saw it as terrible and torture and turned out not to be. It turned out, yes, it was under the classical description. Most people would say, well, that's a post-traumatic, that's a trauma. And I did in two and a half hours and something minutes, two and a half hours, he did not see it as a trauma. If you went to him right now, he would say that's one of the greatest things that happened in his life. It salvaged his marriage. It helped his business and achieve things. It helped him financially. It helped his health. And now he's got a life that's more prioritized. So he'd say, what little I went through compared to what I got out of it, thank you. So it's about perception. And you can sit there and run a story and be the victim, or you can get on with finding out how it serves you and move forward. I'm not denying what's happened. The act has happened. It's how you perceive it now. What are you what are you gonna do with it? You can play it? You you know, if you if you grow from it, then it's you use it to your advantage and you're not a victim of it. You're now master of your destiny. If not, you're a victim of your history. So I'd rather ask questions and help people see master of destiny and and, and transform the perception to reframe it and turn it into an opportunity. I'm not denying it happened. It happened. He was hijacked. But he was also unconsciously willing to get those outcomes and it got him there. How do we begin to see things as they are then in the moment rather than how we subjectively see them to be? Well, most of the time we live with fantasies. Our amygdala wants a pleasure without a pain, a positive without a negative, a nice without a mean, a kind without a cruel, all the moral hypocrisies that society promotes onto people. Your grandmother comes to you and says, be nice, don't be mean, be kind, don't be cruel, be positive, don't be negative, be peaceful, don't be wrathful, be generous, don't be stingy. 
you know, be giving, don't be taking. And then she goes around and demands from grandpa, yells and bitches at grandpa five minutes later. These are all moral hypocrisies. I'm writing a textbook on morality right now and the evolution and, and anthropological aspects of morality. And it's murky. And we go around and we, we don't realize it's basically the oppressor over the oppressed. It's somebody who has power that sets the rules. And those rules are what is in favor of them in most cases, because it's usually powerful people that have power and money, plutocracies or some aristocracies or monarchies or whatever. Even if it's a democracy in our country in America, it's still a partly a plutocracy. And it's the people that have power and they are involved in getting the rules set up. The guy that lives in the real poorer town, his, his influence on those rules is very little. And so in the middle class, you have a middle influence, but on the upper class, you get a lot more influence because they're the people that have monies for you know, lobbying and everything else to get the changes they want. So those rules are not necessary truths. They're just rules that humans come up with. As John Locke says, they're, they're social structures and contracts that we set up based on the beliefs at the time, et cetera. But if you study moral theory, you're going to find that it's murky and there's all kind of moral theories and there's pros and cons to every theory that's out there. As, as Jeremy Bentham says in his consequentialism, utilitarian consequentialism, um, he basically said, you know, the greatest happiness for the most people. So somebody came along and he said, well, if that was true, then if we see a sad person, we should eliminate them because they're lowering the quotient. <laughs> so let's kill anybody that's sad and we get a higher quotient for the happiness of the people. And there's all kinds of situational ethics that all the different morals and ethics we come up with have murky situations where it doesn't apply. So beware of those because those are artificial things that we inculcate into our consciousness from childhood, mothers, fathers, preachers, teachers, that we, as Kohlberg says, eventually have to transcend when we hit our, hit our 40s and finally wake up and then go, what, who are we? And that's why I do the value determination to help you find out what they are and not what that should be or ought to be or supposed to be mm. or got to be and have to be. Because then you actually can be, live an inspired life. You can't live an inspired life living under deontology and duty subordinating to the world around you. Not going to happen. Is that what you mean then by fulfillment is proportional? Yeah. Uh, Ernest Becker wrote a book, The Denial of Death, and he said there were two. We have the fear of death, and the fear of death is the fear of loss of pride and fear of loss of fantasies we concoct in our mind with our amygdala. But we have the fear of death, and because of that, we come up with an immortality strategy. And one of them is a conforming to the masses, which is called the collective hero, and the other one is the individual hero. He said the collective hero, they just follow what everybody tells them, and they just conform. And they they quiet lives of desperation, as Thoreau said. And they're borrowed visionaries, not unborrowed visionaries. The individual has the courage to set a new trend. And they think out of the box and they create original ideas that usually are ridiculed and violently opposed, but they change the course of history. And those are the Elon Musk and those are the Steve Jobs and those are the people that original ideas that serve. That's one of the statements I say every morning. I create original ideas that serve humanity. I'm, I, I'm not here to subordinate to the world around me. I'm here to to, to communicate what is inspiring to me to the world around me. And in the process of doing it, the majority of people fit and conform and fit in and lose their soul, as he says in the book, instead of actually reclaim their soul. And there's an old proverb from the ancient Romans that says, I'd rather have the whole world against me than my own soul. And the soul is the state yes. of unconditional love that you get to be when you're authentic and you're living congruently with what you value and you're inspired and grateful for your life. That's your soul. And that's not narcissistic. Those, that's, some people like to say, well, then you're narcissistic. No, no. The people who live by their highest values are the most philanthropic people I've met. They found out what they love doing and they find a way of bringing that greatness to people and serving great numbers of people. And that I don't find that narcissistic. I find narcissism as a byproduct of subordinating to outer authorities and then thinking with your false ego that you're actually doing it and then being cocky and proud thinking you are superior. That's the false ego, not the true ego. The true ego is not something to, to rid yourself of. The true ego is something to be grateful for. I, I have two, two paths I want to head down with this right here. First being the, the statements that you say to yourself in the morning. Are those t meant for you to prime your mind to think in a certain way and see things as, as a certain way? Or are they more in the line of affirming and manifesting the things that you want to create in your life? A little of both. Um, the, the, I, I am a genius and I apply my wisdom was given to me by a elderly gentleman when I was just turned 18 years old. Because I told the gentleman that 
that I, I didn't know how to read. I had a speech impediment. I had learning problems. I didn't know how I was going to do it. And he told me to say that to myself every single day. If I say that every single day and never miss a day for the rest of my life, sooner or later, the cells in my body will tingle with it and so will the world. So I've been saying that in honor of that teacher since I was 18 every single day of my life. I then asked my mom later on, what exactly is a genius? I didn't really know what it meant at the time. And she said, well, it's people like Albert Einstein and Da Vinci. I said, well, then get me every book you can on those two guys. I want to devour their work and see if I can learn from them. And then I realized that a genius is one who listens to their inner voice and follows their inner vision and lets the voice and the vision on the inside become louder than all opinions on the outside. They trust themselves. When you live by your most highest value and you're, you're, you're living congruently, the voice and the vision on the inside becomes louder than the opinions on the outside. You're on a mission. And I'm a man on a mission with a vision and a message, and I follow that every day. And most people kind of wish they could be doing that, but they, they flounder because they've got internal conflicts between what they're called to do inside, it's intrinsic, and all the expectations and shoulds. And I, I listen to them, and I point them out to people. They're telling me all these things. Well, I need to do this. I got to do this. I should do this. I'm supposed to do this. I have to do this. If you structure your life where you think that, okay, well, I delegate all that. I found something that I love doing that I can't wait to get up in the morning and do. And I find a way of doing that in a way that serves people, which I'm remunerated for in a sustainable, fair exchange and transactions doing it. And that provides me the income to live moderately and then save and invest until the passive income exceeds active income. And in the process of doing it, hire the people that delegate anything that I'm not inspired to do. That's not my core competence. People don't realize how important it is to be integral to yourself and live in your core competence. Mine is teaching, researching, writing, and traveling. Outside that, I'm a klutz. I'm an idiot. <laughs> how does one differentiate between an egoic thought and that of their intuition? Your intuition is constantly trying to reveal to you the unconscious part that you're ignoring. If you're infatuated with somebody and you're blind to the downside, your intuition is trying to point out the, the downsides of that which you're infatuated with. And if you're resentful to somebody, your intuition is trying to point out the upsides. Your intuition is a homeostatic negative feedback system trying to get you to see both sides simultaneously so you can set real objectives, not fantasies, and avoid nightmares. The amygdala wants a fantasy, wants to avoid a nightmare. The executive center wants you to see both sides and set real objectives and mitigate the risk so you're prepared for what's happening and you have foresight, not hindsight. And that's what intuition is trying to do. And most people confuse intuition with gut instinct. It's not the same. Gut instinct is trying to prevent you from something that's frightening you and avoid it. It's like a predator. Gut impulse is trying to get you to prey. Intuition is trying to neutralize the prey and predator to show you that the prey has downsides and the predator has upsides. Because if you had prey without predator, you'd get gluttonous and fat and lose fitness. If you had predator without prey, you'd get emaciated and starved and lose fitness. You put prey and predator together in equal quantities, maximum growth and development occurs and fitness occurs when you put those two together. So I'm interested in putting back into balance. That's why my whole Demartini method is about asking questions that help people see the balance sy synchronously and they liberate themselves from emotions. Anything you infatuate with or resent can occupy space and time in your mind. It's going to run your life until you balance it. So if you want a, a noisy mind and you don't want to be able to sleep very well, then get caught with infatuations and resentments and, and not listen to your intuition, which is trying to neutralize them and watch how difficult it is to sleep. But if you actually listen to the intuition and actually bring yourself back into balance and see both sides, you'll rest like a baby and you won't age. Because part of the entropy that runs you and causes you aging is all the disowned parts. It was, um, it was Claude Shannon and two other guys that got to prof at MIT that got the Nobel Prize on information theory that showed that order is seeing all the information and having mindfulness and disorder is missing information. And the definition of entropy is missing information. And entropy is what ages us. In uh, What is Life by Erwin Schroeder, a Nobel Prize winner, he said that in that book, that negentropy is the opposite of entropy. Negentropy is reclaiming the missing information and seeing the whole simultaneously. And that's why I ask people questions that are the opposite of what most people think. So what's the benefit of the tragedy? And where was the other side? And I balance the equation, which is what your intuition is constantly trying to get you to do. 
and you strengthen your inner knowing and you have you see the hidden order and the apparent chaos and now you're grateful. Nothing's out of order. Out of order is nothing but missing information. And it was Wolfram, Stephen Wolfram, that showed that all entropy is nothing more and all disorder is nothing but computational boundaries. We, we basically have a limit in our understanding. We're not asking the right questions to see the whole. Once we see the whole, we're, we're in a state of grace. The magnificence of the human ideas is greater than any fantasies we keep imposing. What then is the most actionable or simplistic way of someone getting back in touch with their intuition if they haven't listened to it for so long that they forget that it even exists? Well, I developed a method for that, and that's I call it the Demartini method. And what it is is it's asking you a series of questions that's balancing out your perceptions, holding you accountable until they're balanced. And the moment they're balanced, yes. your intuition gets stronger and stronger as you do it. And the answers come faster and faster because of it. And it's just holding yes. people accountable to see things instead of running their story. People want to run their narrative about how they, they're they infatuated with somebody. I had a girl yesterday I consulted with from a Perth, Australia, no, Adelaide, Australia. And she says, I met this older guy and and I just know he's the one. And I and I, I said, so what are the downsides? Oh, I don't know. I don't see any downsides. I said, well, then you have an infatuation. You're blind. So I said, I'm not even going to talk to you right now. I want you to go get a piece of paper and write down 100 drawbacks of this guy. When you get done, call me back. <laughs> and then she, she, all of a sudden, she was going, and I didn't ask her to make anything up. I just asked her to look. And when she did, she called him back. She says, thank you. I'm centered. I re-empowered because I was playing underdog, and he was he was going to take advantage of me, and I have a habit of doing this. I get all infatuated, and then I play underdog. And then I sacrifice, and then I end up getting left, and I go through the cycle. And I say, well, you were, you, I know that. I know that about you, so that's why I asked you to write those things down and calm it down. And I said, I don't want you to write anything that you're not certain about. Write only the downside you see. And then she says, he lives in another country. It would be a long-distance relationship. He's up in age. He's, he's kind of set in his ways. He doesn't want to have kids. He doesn't want to have this. He doesn't want to have this. And I said, these are all the things you were blind to and overlooking when you were holding on to the fantasy. Whenever you see more similarities and difference, you know you're infatuated. Whenever you see more differences and similarities, you know you see you resent them. So when somebody comes up and, oh my God, we have the same number of eyes, same number of ribs, same number of uh, arms and legs, we're soulmates. I go, yeah, 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 you're infatuated, blind. <laughs> What's the downside? If, I, if they say, well, we're, we have nothing in common. We're going in two different directions, and he's a narcissist. I know that you're seeing more drawbacks and benefits. I see that every week. And none of those yes. are true. The human being is worthy of love. They're not worth putting on pedestals or pits, but they're worth loving. And just know that anything you can't love in them is a part of you you're not loving in you. As it says in Romans 2.1, um, beware of judging because the thing you judge, you do the same thing. And I've taken thousands of people through that, and I am certain that that's true. And people don't believe that until they actually go through and hold themselves accountable to look at where they do the things they're judging in others. And it's the disowned parts, the things you're too proud or too humble to admit that you see in others that you're not seeing in yourself that's creating the void, that's driving the value, that's leading to your unfulfillment. So I'm a firm believer in asking questions and owning the traits, put people, take them off the pedestals and pit and put them in your heart and put yourself back in your heart. Come back to equity between you and them and equanimity within yourself. And watch what happens to your achievements, the objectives you set, the things you accomplish, the fulfillment you have, the gratitude level, because you'll be back in your executive center and out of your amygdala's animal brain. Hmm. Well, Dr. Martini, this has been incredibly insightful, and uh, I have pages and pages of questions we could continue to go down. As we wrap up here, I have two final for you here. Um, speak to me a little bit about wisdom and love. Um, my cufflinks, I don't have my cufflinks on today, but my cufflinks say wisdom and love. And I was hitchhiking from Houston, Texas to California when I was 14. And the freeway Interstate 10 was not complete from Houston to, to LA. And I had to get off in, San, in, in uh, El Paso, Texas. I had to get off where the freeway was being built onto the old street road going right through downtown El Paso. And um, when I did that, I had a surfboard and a headband and some sandals and a Hawaiian shirt and some corduroy pants. 
and had a ponytail and long hair, and I had my surfboard with me. And El Paso, Texas is a cowboy town. It's not a surfer's town. And cowboys and surfers didn't get along. Cowboys drank beer and surfers smoked weed, and they just didn't get along too well. And uh, as I came through town, I saw three cowboys line up across the street that were going to confront me because they didn't like what they saw. They didn't like those long-haired hippie kids. And when I saw them, I didn't know what to do because I couldn't outrun them. I couldn't go in the street. Um, I was afraid they're going to destroy my board or hurt, hurt me or something. They were older than I was. I was 14. I was big at 14, but still. And I didn't know what to do. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, something came over me. and some wild thing came out of me. And as I got close to him and they lined up on the sidewalk and they were going to give me a hard time, I started acting like a wild animal and I started growling and, and barking at him <laughs> and just growled at these guys. And they moved out of the sidewalk and I thought, man, this guy's crazy. You know, we don't know what to do with this. And they moved aside and I went right through them and growled at them. They let me be. And when I walked past him, there was a guy leaning on a lamppost, an old guy leaning on a lamppost, who saw that, and he was laughing his butt off. And he came up to me, and he put his arm on my shoulders, and he said, young man, you took care of them cowpokes like a pro. That's the funniest dang thing I've ever seen. He says, can I buy you a cup of coffee? And I said, no, sir, I don't drink coffee. Can I buy you a Coca-Cola? Yes, sir. So he took me to a malt shop and bought me a Coca-Cola on those swivel stools back in those days, back in 1968. And after I, I, I had my board sitting there in the, by, right behind me and my bag, and he says, are you done with your Coke? And I said, yes, sir. And he says, then I want you to follow me. Come with me. I grabbed my stuff, or I walked about two, two, three blocks, another two, three blocks, walked up these steps, and right in the information booth at this library, the El Paso downtown library, he, he asked the woman to keep an eye on my stuff while we went in the library. He took me into the library, and we walked down some steps and up some other steps, and he sat me down at a table, and he went off to the bookshelves, and he came back with two big books and set them on the table. And he sat catty corner to me on the corner of the table, and he, he said, young man, I have two things I want to teach you. You've got to promise me you'll never forget this for the rest of your life. I said, yes, sir. He said, number one, don't ever judge a book by its cover. It'll fool you. He said, you probably think I'm old, some old bum on the street. But young man, I got, I'm one of the wealthiest men in the world. I got anything that money can buy. I got cars and planes and businesses and ships and homes. I mean, I've got everything that money can buy. He said, but let me explain something to you, son. Uh, don't, let a, don't let a book cover throw you off. Then he said, now number two. He took my hand and he stuck them on top of the two books. And the reason he picked those books is because they were Plato and Aristotle. And on the cover, there was no fancy cover. It was like an encyclopedia that was worn out and dark colored. And it was nothing to, you never know what was even inside it. That's why he picked that. Don't judge a book by its cover. But he put my hand on those two books and he said, young man, you learned how to read. And he says, you, you, you learned how to read, boy. Because there's only two things they can never take away from you in your life. See, they can take away your loved ones. They can take away your possession. But they can never take away your love and your wisdom. So you gain the wisdom of love and the love of wisdom for Lo Sophia, young man. And you promised me that. And I said, yes, sir. And he took the books and put them back on the bookshelves. And he, he took me over to the store and he showed me where to go back on the freeway and get, go to California. And I thought, wow. That was cool. And I never forgot that. I later found out that was Howard Hughes. And he was there yes. doing an El Paso natural gas deal for a brewery he was building in Austin, Texas at El Paso Natural Gas, which is about two blocks from there. And I just happened to run into him. This is right before he was there in Las Vegas with his germophobias and things. And I didn't know that till much later. When I met somebody inside the family of them, and then I saw pictures, I went, oh my God, he wasn't joking. He was one of the wealthiest men in the world. I remember him saying that, but I didn't believe it at the time. So love and wisdom are my two cufflinks. I have both gold and silver cufflinks that say love and wisdom because 
I've been dedicated to the wisdom of love and the love of wisdom. And um, so, yeah, our most authentic self has that. When we're authentic, we're grateful. We have grace. We have love. We have inspiration. We have true enthusiasm, not excitement, not mania, but true entheos, the divine within. And St. Augustine said equanimity within. We are certain. We're not wavering with emotions. We're present. We're not living in past and future where we have fears and guilts and shames and prides. We're present. And that's wisdom. When we can see the synthesis and synchronicity of all complementary opposites simultaneously, we have the wisdom of love and the love of wisdom. So that's all of the things I do. Every, every bit that I work on for the sake of self-mastery and help people master their lives is for that objective. So love and wisdom is a cornerstone of everything I do. In reference to The One Thing by Gary Keller, what is the one thing or the one input that you think everyone should know about human behavior? The one thing is your highest value. Your ontological identity revolves around your highest value. Your teleological purpose revolves around your highest value. Your epistemological area of expertise and core competence revolves around your highest value. That highest value, when it says in the Delphic Oracle, know thyself, be thyself, love thyself, your identity is the highest value. I'm a teacher. That's my identity. That's who I am. If I live that way and I give myself permission to be that person, I'll love myself and I'll love life. And that's great wisdom. It's stand the test of time. So yeah, identify what your highest value, because that's the one thing that you're going to excel at. Mine's teaching. Thank you so much for your time today. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, just thank you for the opportunity to share because you helped me reach somebody that I may never have gotten to meet. And maybe I, by some of the stories or questions, maybe it, it woke them up to a new way of looking at, at their perspectives in life and if so, thank you. You're helping me fulfill my long-term mission that I set out to do when I was 17.